Evolution is one of the most interesting aspects of, of informational science because it's the ultimate bootstrap system. You've got these letters strung together on DNA that have over billions of years encoded themselves into the most sophisticated system on the planet. And it's everywhere around us. And in theory, artificial intelligence could look at that and understand every piece of it the same way that the, the, every cell does. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, I am talking to Greg Hannum, the VP of AI Research at Absci, and Sean McLean, the founder and CEO of Absci. And I'm talking with them about drug discovery and development and manufacturing and how ML fits into that. And that's what Absci does. This is a super interesting conversation and I really enjoyed it. Why don't we start with you, Sean, and maybe you could explain you know, to our audience what Absci does and this might be like explaining it to your mother or something, right? Like, you know, I think everyone's sort of interested in these applications, but maybe doesn't really understand the deep biology or really even the industry that you're in. Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, it's pretty simple. We are merging biology and, and AI together. And one of the, the really exciting aspects of, of our, our technology is that we are able to screen or look at billions of different drug candidates looking at the the functionality of those drugs as well as the the manufacturability and that's compared to what the industry is currently doing is is looking at drug candidates in, in the tens of, of thousands but if you look at a you know protein based you know sequence uh you know like a monoclonal antibody you all are familiar with with covid you know Lily's uh, antibody that that came out. That's that's a protein, and if you look at a you know protein you know sequence, there's more sequence variants in an antibody than there are atoms in in, in the universe. And so what we're essentially doing is is feeding in all of these billions of different data points on on the protein functionality and manufacturability to ultimately be able to predict the best drug candidate for a particular disease or or indication. And and essentially what we our vision is to become the Google index search of drug discovery and, and biomanufacturing, where we can take patient samples, find the specific biomarker or target for that particular disease, and then utilize you know deep learning and, and AI to predict the best drug candidate for that particular target or, or biomarker. Uh, all at, at, at a click of a button and, and totally changing the, the paradigm of, of healthcare and, and biotech and, and ultimately getting the absolute best drug candidates to, to patients at, at, at truly unprecedented speeds. And, and it's this really exciting forefront of, of, again, merging biology and AI together. And then do you ultimately take these drugs to market and sell them? Like how, how far do you go in this process? Do, do you just sort of invent them and then hand them off? How does that work? Yeah, so it's really a, a, a perfect marriage of, of what we do and, and what pharma does. So pharma is really good at being able to design clinical trials, take the drugs through the clinical trials, and then ultimately market them. And where we come in is being able to assist the, the pharma and biopharma companies with actually designing and, and creating the, the drug itself. And then we out license it to the large pharma to take through the clinical trials, as well as you know, commercializing it. And we get milestones and, and royalties on, on that, which essentially uh, in, in the world of, of tech is, is uh, another version of a SaaS model, um, but based on, on the you know, clinical trials and, and ultimately the, the approval of the drug product. And, and how, I guess, how far along is this? Like, what's the, the drug where you've used these techniques that's kind of closest to something that, you know, cures a disease? Yeah, so we have one product that we're working on right now that is in phase three, and they are, are planning on, on implementing our, our technology post BLA uh, approval. And so, you know, we're, we're, you know, potentially assuming the, the drug gets approved, uh, you know, uh, a few years away from uh, actually seeing, uh, uh, you know, that drug in, uh, on the market. And, and so that, that would be our, our first 
you know, drug candidate that, that would, you know, make it to, to the market, you know, utilizing our, our technology. And, and what does it do? Unfortunately, due to confidentiality, I can't, I can't disclose that, but I'm hoping here in the very near future that we will be able to disclose that. But I, I, I will say in general, most of the programs that we work on are, are either on, you know, immuno-oncology or in, infectious, in infectious diseases. Um, but our platform's really agnostic to the types of uh, indications or, or diseases that we, we can go after. But we really focus on where the industry is focused. And, and a lot of that is, is on uh, oncology. And that's because, is that because cancer is such a big deal or and, and so many people get it or some other reason? Yeah, I would say that that is, you know, one of the the, the big uh, diseases that uh, you know the the industry is is focused on, and and uh, you know where where a lot of innovation can can be. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we're our technology is really an enabling technology. So we take the the ideas that our pharma partners have; they're the experts on the biology and saying, hey, we need to design a, a drug that has these attributes that can do this. We then enable them to to be able to, to do that, and and you know that's across you know really all diseases and indications. And so, forgive me for such basic questions, but I'm I'm really curious how this works. So, like a, a pharma company would come to you and say, "Is it as simple as like we want to like cure this specific disease, and we need a, a molecule that that cures this disease?" Is, do, do I have that right? I mean, how does that how does that happen? And, and then what, what do you deliver? Is it like, here's a molecule or here's like 20 you should try or here's how we think about it? Yeah, and the simplest way of, of looking at it, it's exactly how, how you described it. So they, they come to us and say, hey, we have this you know, particular you know, target or indication and, and this is the, the biology. And, and if we design a, a, a drug that has these attributes, we think that this drug candidate then could kill this cancer cell, and they then have to, you know, perform, you know, uh, you know, the animal models, and then ultimately take it, you know, in, into the clinic to to prove their their hypothesis on that. Um, and we're assisting them in being able to discover the the drug candidate that has the the properties that that are needed to to solve the biology, you know, problem that. Uh, that they've, you know, determined is is going to ultimately, you know, um, you know, cure or or you know improve that that you know particular disease. And and when you say drug candidate, is that literally a molecule? It, that is in, in our case, that is a a protein that is being used as a drug. So there's protein based drugs, and then there are small molecule. Um, based drugs, so small molecule drugs, you know, at, you know, Advil, uh, you know, Vicodin, uh, you know, basically a pill in a bottle, and then you have the protein-based drugs or, or biologics, uh, such as uh, you know, insulin, and and a lot of the you know exciting uh, monoclonal antibodies, you know, again, kind of going back to you know Lily's uh, you know COVID uh, antibody or Regeneron's you know COVID antibody. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, protein-based drugs, and and the interesting thing with the protein-based drugs is you can't chemically synthesize it. Uh, you actually have to make it in, in a living organism, so that you know, uh, you know, adds adds more com- complexity to discovering these molecules as well as manufacturing them. But can you predict exactly what the protein is going to look like and then look at it and, and see if it does it? Is that all in simulation or are there surprises when you actually try to manufacture it? Yeah. So there's a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, surprises that, that can uh, occur. And uh, we are not to the point uh, where we can, you know, predict, uh, you know, drug functionality. That's ultimately where, where we're headed with, with all of this. Uh, and, and a lot of times if you can, you know, predict the, the, the functionality of, of a protein, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can manufacture it. So many times we see with, with large pharma, uh, they, they discover these, these really exciting uh, novel breakthrough you know, protein therapies, but ultimately can't take them to, to the clinic because they can't, they can't manu- manufacture them. So you not only have to predict the, the protein um, you know, functionality uh, but you also have to be able to predict the the manufacturability of it as as well. 
Uh, and and we're really looking at at both of those. You know, really what you know AlphaFold has has done with um, being able to predict the the protein structure based off of the amino acid sequence. Uh, where we're headed is being able to predict the uh, protein function or or protein protein uh, interaction. So it's the other side of the coin, and you know it was a huge breakthrough for for AlphaFold for basic research. You know what we're doing is it is is going to be a huge breakthrough in drug discovery and and biomanufacturing. Um, again, it's kind of just the opposite you know, side of the coin uh, from what AlphaFold has done. I want to make sure I heard you right. Did you say you're not predicting the functionality? We are predicting the protein functionality. And the functionality is how it interacts with another protein? Exactly. It's, you know, how, how tight does it does it bind to, to another protein? And then also, too, we take into considered consideration like immunogenicity. Is it going to, to react in the body um, once it's uh, ad- administered? And then also taking a look at the, uh, the, the, the CMC or manufacturing um, aspects. Is it, you know, soluble and stable? Can it, you know, be produced at, at high yields? Um, and so these are other um, uh, predictions that, that we take into to account or other attributes we take into account. Interesting. I, I want to hear more about how this actually works, but I guess one question I want to make sure that I asked you is that, you know, I saw that you started your company in, I think, 2011, right? And and it seems like ML as applied to medicine has changed so much. I'm curious if you started your company with this perspective or, or how different it was, and also how your perspective on machine learning has changed as you know machine learning has evolved and deep learnings come along. Yeah. So we did not start off as uh, as an AI company. I'd say we are very similar to you know. Tesla's evolution. You know, Tesla started out as an electric car manufacturer. They started collecting all, all this data from, from their sensors, you know, built a, an AI team around that. And now they're, you know, a fully autonomous self-driving car, you know, uh, tech company. And, and that's a, you know, I'd say a very similar evolution that, you know, Absci is is on. We we started out on on the biology side and engineering uh, E. coli to be more mammalian-like to really shorten uh, the development times and, and, and decrease manufacturing costs. And we, we then built out this uh, technology that allowed us to screen billions of, of, of different E. coli cells and, and look at uh, different uh, variants of, of proteins, looking at basically the, the drug functionality, and then also looking at, can you actually you know, manufacture this? And so we started generating all of this this data you know billions of different data points on on the protein you know functionality and and the manufacturability and we knew that if we could leverage that 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 data with deep learning we could uh get to the point where we could predict the 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 protein functionality uh needed for you know every type of, of of target or um, or, or indication, and and that's you know ultimately what led us to to acquire uh, Denovium, you know, a pioneer in in, in uh, you know deep learning uh, you know technology for for protein engineering. But uh, it, it really started off with with the data. You know, data is so so key, and we have proprietary data that that no one else has that we are then you know uh, uh, you know leveraging you know deep learning to to mine that to get to, to get us to the point where we can ultimately predict, you know, protein functionality. And, and where, where we're currently at right now is, is being able to take the, leverage the data we already have and be able to predict the best billion member libraries we should be, we should be screening for, for every new, new target or indication we work on. And eventually, as we train the model with more and more of our proprietary data, uh, the more and more predictive it's going to get. So instead of predicting a billion member library, it starts predicting you know, uh, a million, a thousand, and then ultimately predicting the the absolute best drug candidate for a given target or indication. You know, looking at the what modality should it be, the affinity, low immunogenicity. You know, all the manufacturing attributes that 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 you want. And so, right now, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a race uh, to to feed uh, as much data as we possibly can. But it all it all started off with the the biology. Uh, technology that we had uh, originally developed. 
And so for you, Sean, as a CEO of a of a company that's that's not a deep learning company, I'm curious how you first got exposed to deep learning and what made you think that it might be useful and then how you got conviction around making these large investments in deep learning that you're doing now. Like what were you seeing that that made you feel like it would work? And it seems like you're more bullish on it than maybe a lot of your peers. And I, I wonder where that might be coming from. I'm bullish because we have the the data. Again, it all goes back to to data. And you know we have high quality data on on the the, the protein functionality and, and and manufacturability, and and it goes back to an earlier point that I made, which was there are more sequence variants in, in an antibody than there are atoms in the in the universe. So there's no like screening technology that we could ever create that would allow us to to mine you know, that big of a space. And, and that's really where, you know, the deep learning, you know, comes in into play is, is being able to uh, essentially sift through all of the potential evolutionary paths that, that, you know, uh, you know, a, a drug could be created in and figure out what is that, that best drug, drug candidate, basically mine that whole, that, that whole search space and, and, and ultimately come to the point where, uh, you know, we're we're creating the, the the best drugs for for patients, and yeah, and and I think we've seen you know huge. Uh, uh, once we've implemented the the you know the deep learning technology, we've already seen you know huge gains in in terms of of of, of yields and and you know and the types of drugs that can be uh, discovered when taking our data and pairing it up with with deep learning and. And ultimately, where I see us going is is becoming, you know, a full a full tech company once uh, you know we, we have a, a, enough data here. And so I'm I'm extremely bullish on 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 AI and and what it can do within healthcare. But it's interesting talking to you in that, you know, we work with I guess a lot of pharma companies, which I, I see are slightly different in their in what they do than you. But it seems like their perspective is interested in in deep learning but probably not at the ceo level except the the sense that they're kind of making i say small or medium investments whereas you want to transform your entire company in this direction do do you think that you're doing something different than your competitors around around deep learning like do, do you think that you you can be the best at this in some way I do think that that we can be the best, and I would say that the the industry is starting to understand the benefits of what deep learning and and ML can can provide. And biotech probably doesn't have as a, a great appreciation for you know tech and you know machine learning and and really what that really means, and and you know vice versa. Like you know the the tech industry doesn't you know quite understand like all. Uh, the you know that goes into to biology and it's really exciting to be able to take two industries two cultures and and merge them to together to really create something that's going to be hugely impactful for patients and and ultimately the the world that's super cool and I mean thanks for doing an interview like this I think this is really great for um, for kind of cross pollinating ideas I love these um, I guess I, I have a lot of Maybe a slightly more technical question. So, so Greg, feel free to jump in if you like. But one thing I wonder about with um, with kind of ML applied to this stuff is: do, do you feel like it was always a latent possibility to um, successfully be able to make these predictions that you're doing now, and it was just a matter of getting enough data, or do you feel like there's been breakthroughs in machine learning? in like model architectures or something like that, that have actually made this a more practical application? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's, it's a great question. Uh, I, I would say that, uh, that it's a little bit of both, um, both that the there has always been potential for ML in bio and has been very successful in the past and some of these same indications, but it's been limited both on the data collection side, which is not stagnant. It's moving in, in incredible ways, the same way the AI community has uh, and the AI modeling, 
recent advances in large scale architectures, transformers, um, uh, a, a lot of different techniques for getting these models to converge uh, successfully and, and to be very predictive uh, are, have been incredible breakthroughs as well. That essentially now we're, I'm less concerned about the AI holding back uh, any, any sort of success as I am about making sure that we can marry these two communities, make sure that the, the, the what is always an intrinsically messy process of collecting biological data uh, is actually connected to the, the, the inputs and outputs of that AI, which, you know, as, as, as Sean will be the first to tell you, is this, would be the, this is a great place to be able to do that at because a lot of that hard work of actually developing the, these assays and, and working through that, that uh, challenging space is, uh, is part of the bread and butter of EPSI. Could you give me a, maybe a concrete example of an ML breakthrough that helped with this? Like, you know, for example, I think of transformers, you know, I know of them as, you know, technology, mostly for natural language processing. I could sort of imagine how this might apply um, to what you're doing, but maybe could you, could you walk me through, um, you know, some, some kind of architecture, some kind of um, new way of doing things and how you, how you frame the biology in this machine learning world? Yeah, so I'll give a couple of examples that have come over the last few years. Um, the biggest related to scaling. Um, so the biological problems are necessarily complex. Evolution is one of the most interesting aspects of, of informational science because it's the ultimate bootstrap system. You've got these letters strung together on DNA that have over billions of years encoded themselves into the most sophisticated system on the planet. And it's everywhere around us. Um, and in theory, and, and a artificial intelligence could look at that and understand every piece of it the same way that the, the, every cell does. Uh, so what you need to do to connect these dots now is in getting collecting enough data of different parts of the system. Namely, you need a lot of nucleotide data. So we need to do DNA sequencing, but we need that from lots of different organisms. And we need to understand how they translate into proteins. We understand how those proteins act and function, where they bind together, how they fold together is an incredible number of pieces that need to come together and to see that big picture. Uh, and this is where scale becomes very important. It's a, it's a bigger problem than some traditional ML or even the original deep learning uh, architectures are capable of solving because it simply requires more parameters, requires more complexity, requires better understanding. Um, NLP based models and transformers in general uh, are really good for this domain because the, a lot of what we operate on is in the sequence space. Uh, but I wouldn't say that they're the only approach to this either. Um, but uh, those advancements in letting us get to larger and larger models to create the GPT-3 of, of, of DNA uh, is something that, that really gives us, uh, uh, for the first time, a real handle on these challenges. There's this trend in, in NLP, which I'm you know, much more familiar with, of um, models becoming kind of more and more black boxes, sort of less and less um, informed maybe by um, linguists. I don't know if every linguist I've had on this podcast would, would agree with that, but I think like broadly um, as the data increases and the model complexity increases, uh, they become sort of more open. Is there a similar trend in, in these applications where maybe the, the chemistry and physics matters less and you just sort of treat it as this translation from um, you know, letters to, did the drug get successfully produced or not? Or is there sort of, do you still in, inject your knowledge of biology or chemistry or physics to, to make the whole system work? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been moving in that direction, but we're not there yet. Uh, biology is uh, that those two communities still haven't fully been, been united. Uh, there have been some big advancements uh, recently in the protein biology space. And uh, the MSA transformer uh, is a big example of this where, uh, being able to take something that bioinformaticians and computational biologists have been doing for years of aligning sequences to see what kind of patterns they share uh, in nature uh, can be used as an input directly with a special kind of architecture to let uh, models learn from that. So these sorts of biologically inspired architectures are still coming. Uh, and AlphaFold is another great example of one where they, they did a number of uh, relatively novel techniques uh, and combining them together was really key to the success. So. Uh, the black box approach is powerful and I, I wouldn't downplay it, but we're still plenty of room for improvement. But I think that's ultimately like where, where we want this to, to go is you can, you know, input in a, a, a target sequence and, you know, be able to have the, the output be the, 
the the sequence for the the drug candidate and you know predict all, all the binding just based off of you know the the sequence itself and and I would say too that we've already seen uh, some really interesting discoveries that that uh, have occurred from you know our deep learning models showed that we got in, you know increase in in overall yields from this from this protein that wasn't necessarily classified as, as a chaperone, but our, you know, our deep learning, you know, model predicted that it, that it would be. And, uh, you know, I think these are some of the really interesting, you know, discoveries that are going to be, you know, occurring, uh, uh, at a very rapid pace by, by bringing, you know, the, the AI and biology together. I'm curious, uh, Sean, like, how do you think about investing in data collection versus your ML team? Like, do, do you think like, I mean, I feel like there's maybe two ways to improve your models, like, you know, going out and collecting more data, which is probably really one type of investment versus like building up like ML expertise. Do, do you think about it that way? And do you feel like there's a trade off there? Or how do you look at that? I think investments in both is, is absolutely critical. And I, you, you can't in, invest in, in one and neglect the, the other. You really have to make uh, the strong investments in, in both. And, you know, right now, uh, a big investment of ours is, you know, what is all the data that, that we want to be feeding in, into the models? Like looking out, you know, 10 years, are we going to regret not collecting this piece of data? And then how do we, you know, build our, our, our databases and, and, and scale the, the amount of data that's, that's needed in, in, in the future? And so, uh, and, and, and then how do we, you know, collect it as, as quickly as, as we possibly can to, you know, then, you know, hand it over to, to our, you know, ML team to, to be able to, you know, continue to, to train and improve, uh, you know, the, the models. And we've made uh, huge in investments in, in, in both, uh, both from the wet lab side, the, 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 the data capture uh, and, and, you know, the, the database and scaling that along with the, the AI team. I mean, as a, as a more of a computer scientist, I'm definitely kind of enamored at the idea of a, a wet lab. I mean, could you describe what, <laughs> what, what happens there, what that, that collection process looks like? Yeah. So, uh, we just built out a, uh, I think it was 88,000 square foot uh, campus. Half of the campus is is office space, and then the other half is is an actual lab. And the the lab is you know super key to to what we do, and it's uh, you know it, it ranges all the way from you know the the drug discovery team all the way down to you know the the, the team you know our fermentation and purification team that you know, grow up the, the, the cells and, and ultimately purify them. And, uh, you know, a lot of the data that we're feeding into our deep learning models is uh, next generation sequencing uh, data and, and flow cytometry uh, data. And that's really key. And some of the, the breakthroughs uh, within NGS really, and, and the speed at which we can, um, you know, um, process uh, uh, NGS data is, is really a, a enabling us to to do what we do. And so it's really fun to be able to, to, you know, grow a team that's both on the wet lab side and then the, the, the AI and, and ML side. And, 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 and also too, I would say like a, an AI scientist that, that understands the biology is like absolutely critical to, to what we do. And, uh, and, and the town on, on that side is, um, uh, there's not a lot of it out there, but we've done a really amazing job of building out talent that that understands um, you know both aspects. Maybe this is a stupid question, but what goes on in a wet lab these days? Like, is it like beakers full of proteins? Is it like kind of mic microfluidics arrays? Like, like I don't know how what is, like how does how does it work, and and how fast can you actually collect meaningful data? Yeah, so we we build these. So we start off with building the these large libraries. Uh, so so we work with uh, what's called a plasmid. It's basically a circular DNA, and that encodes the the drug uh, product. And basically, we vary that that DNA to look at you know various different drug drug candidates. And in a single small test tube, we basically take all those billions of different plasmids and put that into to an E. coli. And it's, it's 
you know, uh, extremely small and you look at it and be like, wow, there's, there's, you know, you know, trillions of cells in there. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. And then we take all of that, we screen it. And then ultimately we find the, the, the drug candidate and, and the cell line. And then we grow it up in big fermentation, uh, uh reactors. So think of like, uh, 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 of, of beer and, and brewing beer. Um, it's essentially big vats that, that are highly controlled and you just grow up, grow up the bugs in there and then, you know, basically give them the, 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 the genetic code to, to make the, the drug candidate and, and, uh, and then you scale it up from, from there. But yeah, it's all, all beakers, fermentation, purification. Yeah. You, you name it, we've got it. I added some a little color to that as well, in that from a background of somebody who doesn't spend every day inside the wet lab, uh, it feels a lot, a lot like uh, stepping into Wonka land. It's uh, you have an amazing amount of, of human ingenuity sitting on every desk, whether it's some mass spectrometer or some sequencing technology, or um, all these devices have very specific and very incredible capabilities, and a bunch of people who are who know what to do with them and know how to put all the pieces yeah. together uh, to to make this stuff happen. It's so funny. I actually think, I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me like, what does a wet lab do? And I, and I was like searching for the words to describe it. I probably did a terrible job, but it's like, uh, I thought it was you, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you don't really quite understand the magnitude until you like step in and, and really understand like every intricate aspect that's, that's, that's being done. I remember the first time I went into one of our customers wet labs, I felt like, oh, this is what I thought science was like when I was a kid. Like, I love yeah. it. <laughs> I, I'm still disappointed. I don't get to show up as a lab code. I might just start <laughs> doing that now, you know? Yeah. It's funny. I never thought about this, but we do a lot of ML experiment tracking, but I would imagine there's a lot of parallels to tracking all the experiments that you're doing in the lab, like, do you have software that does that? Have you you've probably written a lot of software to just keep track of everything that's happening in there, right? Yeah, so we've actually decided to to build a lot of this out our, ourselves, and and Jonathan Eads, who's our uh, VP of, of data sciences, him and his team are actually working at uh, building out a, a database where we we track everything uh in internally based off of the software that they they've developed uh and this is really because there's there's no software solution out there that really met our our needs and uh we we actually just got a demo of it uh the the other day and it's it's really incredible uh what it's going to 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 allow us to do uh not only in the in the data capture but also being able to you know track where, uh, you know, programs are, are at in, in, in the lab where we have bottlenecks. I mean, it's this, uh, it's really this, this brilliant, uh, uh, software that is, is, is really going to, to help expedite, uh, what we currently do and, and be able to, to, to capture the data that's, that's needed for the long-term success. Very cool. Um, I'm curious about how you, how you think about where this goes like wh wh where do you imagine ml taking you as you as you collect more data like do you think the whole process moves to this like do you think you could like run clinical trials essentially in ml and and know if they're going to be successful or not i won't say that we'll be able to run ml for for clinical trials but the the drugs that we do design if indeed we are predicting the best drug candidates for various indications, it's going to increase the overall success rate. And that in turn is going to lead to shorter clinical trial uh, uh, timelines and, and being able to rapidly progress new drug candidates uh, through and, and ultimately lead to the point where we can do personalized medicine because we have shown the the success rates you know dramatically increase uh and 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 allow for for that personalized uh medicine um but who knows we we could here in the future be able to to use uh uh ml for for clinical trial uh, uh design and, and prediction as as well uh and 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 i guess i I, you know, one of our, our core values here is is believing in the impossible. So so I feel bad for not saying, yes, ML will, you know, be able to, uh, you know, 
uh, predict uh, clinical trials uh, uh, and 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 not actually have to go through it. So it'll be really interesting to see see uh, what what's done on that front in the future. What is a typical clinical trial success rate? Uh, right now, it's it's right around four percent. Four percent, but there's different stages, right? Or how does that work? Yeah, so so basically, there there's uh, th- three stages. So you you have your 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 phase one, your phase two, phase three, and then ultimately uh, approval. And so going from a a phase one all the way through approval, it's about a four uh, percent uh, success rate. Wow. Yeah. And just I mean just as a as another CEO, it sounds totally harrowing to me to have my revenue depend on a four percent. <laughs> Success rate process is that? Uh, I mean, how do you stay sane in a in a market like that? Yeah, so the the, the way we we structure uh, our, our our revenue is is one the the pharma partner pays us uh, to actually develop the drug candidate and 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 the cell line. So so we're getting paid for for that, and then we get paid on milestone payments as they progress through the, the clinical trial. So you get, you know, a milestone payment at phase one, phase two, phase three, ultimately approval, and then and then royalties. And so even if a drug doesn't make it to the clinic, you can still get paid these these milestone payments, which are 100 percent pure margin. And so then it's a it's a law of large numbers. It's just a growing the the number of, of programs uh, you you have uh, as 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 quickly as, as as you can, and you you, you ultimately get to, to the point where uh, you, you do get uh, drugs approved, and you know you, you get uh, you know royalties you know coming in for you know ten to fifteen years off of, off of that. Um, but you grow the revenue base just by growing the number of programs every year. And can you say like order of magnitude how many of these you're doing? Is it like thousands? Yeah. So we currently have. Uh, nine active uh, uh, programs on ongoing. Uh, our, uh, our our goal for for this year is is uh, five programs, uh, which we're on track for, and, and then you know uh, increasing those year over year. Um, but no, it's 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 definitely not not thousands. Uh, it's it's more you know on on uh, you know the the the, the tens uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of thousands. And do the programs inform each other? Like, is this similar to to like natural language, where you can have kind of one big model and then kind of fine tune it on the different cases? Yeah. So I, I think that's actually a big part of what why we think this is so exciting uh, is because it really is one physical system underlying a lot of these drugs, and creating a model that can understand this for one drug is is useful. Then for the second one. It presumably will need less training data because it can transfer learn what it understands about the first one, and then you go to the third and the fourth, and and before long, you're as, as Sean was saying, you're the the number of you know shots you need on on goal be, becomes reduced to the point where you any novel drug then becomes a one shot learning problem. So uh, this is uh, yeah, this is exactly where we see it going. Interesting. Is it possible for you guys to engage with the academic? community at all? I mean, I feel like you're actually sort of adjacent to two very different academic cultures, right? There's sort of the ML culture, and then, which I know well, um, but seems like it might be tricky to like share data with. And then um, the like vast, um, you know, medical literature, which I know less well. Do, do, are, are these communities relevant to you at all? Do you try to do any publishing or, or, or engage in some way? Yeah, definitely. We we love to engage uh, in the academic uh, community, and and we are uh, looking to to publish uh, uh, some uh, some papers here in the near future, both on the work that we're doing, but also in you know collaboration with you know some of the leading um, you know uh, you know academic professors uh, in our area, and we we see this as you know. Uh, ways to continue to, to to validate the the work that that we're doing and and improve the science that 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 we have and and leverage uh, you know domain expertise that that we don't have and so uh, the the academic uh, community for for us is um, uh, really uh, you know essential to to the work that that we do and we very much foster those those partnerships and collaborations. Cool. Well, you know, I know a lot of. Um 
ML practitioners that I think would be interested in working in your domain. Can you say anything about what you look for in hiring an ML practitioner that might be different than like, I don't know, a Google or an open AI? Yeah, so I can speak to some of what we've looked for on our team and what we continue to look for going forward. Um, it's uh, There's a lot of the strengths that naturally come from the AI community that we, we like to, to keep going forward. Uh, the, the way that we think about problems, the way that the, um, uh, how we understand the implementation details. As you know, AI can be tricky to execute uh, on, on both the compute and the setup and understanding all the different systems and software that goes into that. But on the totally different side, you have all the biological complexity and it's an entirely different field to be learning. You know, you need a whole nother degree to learn about all the complexities that come from that. And lab scientists and the close relationship with them is really an important piece there. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that it's that that capability to learn because there's so few people who naturally are in both spaces anyway. So it's a capability to learn the patience and the, and the, the rigor uh, to go through and understand uh, all sides of the problem and how to make an impact in the, therein. Uh, it's it's never as easy as um, a lot of AI problems often are, where it's like here's your inputs, here's your outputs, and maximize some scoring function. The it's a it's a lot trickier than that. And the scientists live that day to day. So some, to some extent, it's like well, welcome to our world, uh, and that's great. Like because it means that when we can also say um, this is how AI can address these challenges. It can help clean up that noise. We can help. Uh, better understand what's going on with this process, and and then yes, ultimately build systems that that speed up and maybe even replace uh, a lot of these processes. Shad, I guess in that vein, as you've kind of transitioned from um, not doing a lot of machine learning to really making this heavy investment in machine learning and building out these teams, have there been any any kind of unexpected cultural issues or team issues that you've had to work through that? That, that might have happened because of adding all these um, ML nerds? <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, it, it's having everyone recognize that by combining both, you know, ML with, you know, biology and, and, and the lab scientists that it ultimately is getting to our vision quicker and that it ultimately is impacting, you know, patients' uh, uh, lives in, in ways that we couldn't do without combining it together. I think the first thought is, oh my gosh, Sean, you're, you're bringing in all these you know, AI and, and ML experts and, and are they just going to automate my job away and like, you know, they're going to be able to predict everything and there's going to be no, no, you know, no need for me? And it's like, a- absolutely not. Like, biology is so complex. We have so many problems to solve. Like once we solve you know, one problem with, with AI and we have the data, we then need, you know, the, the, the biology and, and wet lab ex- expertise then to solve the, the next problem and the next problem after that. And like, it, you're, it's, it's never going to go, it's never going to w- go away. And you need both. At the end of the day, you, you can't, you know, stop the, the wet lab and, and the biology, you know, side, because that's what feeds the, the, the data and is, you know, both are, are absolutely uh, critically and important. Uh, and I just love the different perspectives that, you know, both sides bring to the table to, to make uh, our, our company the, the best it you know, possibly can be. It sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, have, have you gotten any questions from your like ML team where you're just like, man, we're just like miles apart here. Like you, you just don't understand what we're doing. No, I think Honestly, everyone has has really done a great job of of understanding the other side's like perspective. And sometimes, you know, the 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 AI team may not be getting data as 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 quickly as as they would like. But then they dive in with the scientists, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I understand. Like, you ran into to this problem, and you know, can we work together to you know increase the the, the throughput or?" You know, it's like, hey, I gave you all this data. Like, I'm not seeing any improvements yet. When is the, you know, when, when are we going to start seeing seeing improvements from from you know from our AI models? And uh, I think it just uh, it, it, it creates uh, you know patience and collaboration, and I think a, a respect for each other's you know part that that they play in in the overall bigger picture. 
Greg, do you agree with this? Should I ask you separately? And then- <laughs> no, no. I, I, I think you nailed it when you, you started by saying it was exciting, and I, I couldn't agree more. This is uh, it's an opportunity of a lifetime to be in sort of the intersection of something like this, uh, and uh, it's it's wonderful to see such smart people and such talented people uh, who are you know are respected in their own field, and then coming together and. There's a there's something very humbling always to be on the other side of things and realizing wow there's always more to learn uh, and it's a uh, um, it's very healthy as Sean said and it's it it does give you a greater sense of context and, and perspective. Well, look, we always end with two questions, and I think you both are coming from super different perspectives, but I'd love to hear your in- both of your answers to this. So, so one question we always end with is, um, what's a topic in ML that you feel is underrated? Uh, versus its impact and i mean this very broadly i mean like i guess sean like what what skills would you do you feel like people should be showing up with what they're not maybe <laughs> when folks come to to absi we're we have we're, we're solving very big complex problems and we you know our, our mantra and our number one value is is you know there for a reason which is you know believe in in the impossible and we are are always looking for for people that are wanting to to push the the limits uh, on both the the AI side as well as the the, the biology side and and really you know bringing that uh, together and we are creating this this new you know ecosystem that that you know really hasn't a- existed and this understanding of of you know what ML can can do for for biology and, and vice versa. And, and so we, we just want to, you know, bring in people that, you know, want to think about things differently and, and, and change paradigms. And, uh, and, and so I'm super excited about where, where the, 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 you know, the future, future lies, uh, with, with, with AI and biology to, together. And we're really on, on the forefront of that. And, uh, and yeah, couldn't be, yeah, couldn't be more excited about where, where the industry is headed. All right. Yeah, I guess I'll give my, my my different take here on what's the under you said underappreciated side of ML. Um, I say that it's a definitely has some appreciation, but could be could be higher is the capability of deep learning and artificial intelligence to do integrative work. So we see an awful lot of research solving specific problems, often hard problems, and they they can compete against each other on performance scores and evaluation. Uh, but the real value. I think in 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 the in the practical world for AI is how well it ties different kinds of information together. Uh, we use this at Absci and trying to collect dozens of different kinds of assays, and we can understand. All right, in context for just one of them, this is a spreadsheet of data. It's not even that large, but maybe if I relate that to uh, the embedding space projection of a of a different model that was trained on a different task, uh, it can tell me something useful about the problem that I'm working on now. And this is a, a philosophy that we're, we're, we're big proponents of, of sort of integrating large multitask systems that can leverage the, the commonalities in the data and understand sort of a, um, all, put them all together. And this, this has an advantage, not just that you get to use all your data on hand and that you get information on that, but it also creates a simplicity to everything where uh, instead of uh, having to run all these different pieces, you can ask you know, from maybe one piece of data, what the other pieces would look like. And you can take a lot of what might be, let's say, uh, in the case of bioinformatics, we have a lot of computational tools for understanding protein function. You can run dozens of these different tools and try to get them all work together and set up your environments. Or you can have one AI model that knows, you know, knows these answers um, and can give it to you in, in a millisecond. Um, and so it's, I think, full appreciation of how well it can simplify problems and bring different kinds of problems together uh, is something that I think is it could use, uh, you know, more appreciation on. And this really works for you. I mean, I feel like a lot of people kind of talk about this kind of like multitask learning and combining problems, but it's always felt a little theoretical to me. Do, do you actually find that it, it, it like meaningfully helps um, on tasks to incorporate data from other tasks? Oh, absolutely. And this was a big part of what we did at, at Denovium was, was um, taking our, our DNA models and protein models, tying them together two entirely different domains of, of, of data. Uh, but it allowed us to, from, you know, users could essentially take a DNA sequence and in just one artificial intelligence model, find all the proteins, what do they do, characterize them with 700,000 different labels, very multitask, um, 
we had something like 25 some odd different databases that were all tied together and, and different uh, 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 so that it could essentially had to multitask quite a bit uh, to solve those challenges. Uh, but it both worked and it really uh, it, it really sped up the progress of what we could do with it, as well as allowed some uh, really unconventional approaches. So Sean was talking earlier about the chaperone discovery work where we could use these protein models to understand uh, what a protein would do if it otherwise hadn't been understood by, by science. Um, and these sorts of models, because they're generalized, there were so many different kinds of tasks, uh, we're, we're not burdened by with memorization. And they can say, oh, yeah, well, hey, look, this looks an awful lot like this. It should do this. Um, and we can we can trust it to, to step outside its box. Is there any paper or something that you could point people to who want to learn more about this? Have, have you been able to publish any of this work? There's uh, some. There's a legacy work that was somewhat of a precursor to it. Uh, I can we can we can pull up the paper later. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Cool. We'll put it in the notes. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And our final question, and Sean, I'm I'm really curious to get your take on this one. Um, you know, Sean, you know, you've been super positive about the promise here, but you guys are actually doing ML and 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 trying to get real results. And so I'm sure that you're running into problems. I'm curious what's been like the biggest unexpected problem trying to go from you know, this idea of something you want to do to actually making it really work in reality? Oh, man, there's there's problems, uh, you know, every which way, you know, I would say, you know, first, it's it's actually convincing uh, the, the the scientific, you know, community and, and our partners that, you know, deep learning and, and AI is 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 the future. And, you know, showing them 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 work and and showing that that this can can actually you know happen. So that's like first you know first hurdle. And, and then I would say like you know the the other you know you know biggest like you know hurdle that and and challenge that that we've had to work through is is being able to one develop the technologies that get us the data, get us the the you know data in a, in a clean format. And then, and then scaling that, that data and, and then, you know, building out, you know, a, a world-class like AI team and, you know, uh, Greg and Ariel uh, and, and, you know, myself with Matthew, I mean, we're always, you know, looking for, for the best talent and how do we, how do we bring them in? Um, but as you know, as, as a, as a fellow, like co- co-founder, it's like, once you think things are, are, are going well, you're always like, you know thrown in uh, off off the deep end and and going in another you know you know path and having to solve another problem and it's just you know um it's continuously like problem solving and but that's the fun of it and then like we've made so much progress and we're going to continue and i think that's like just so much of, of 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 the fun of of you know growing a company and doing what we do Greg, anything you want to add of unexpected uh, hurdles along the way? Unexpected hurdles? Um, I mean, that's that's every day. Uh, then that's that's. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, give that's me exci- one. Give me like one from the like one real story from the from the trenches. Oh, let's see. <laughs> uh, what's a what's a good one that we've 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 discovered recently? Um, it's always getting back to the fact that biological data is messy, uh, and the lab scientists are exceptional at what they do. But things come back that you surprise <laughs> at, and and so. You know, for example, we we assemble these uh, um, uh, these plasmids, these these long stretches of DNA in a circle that can essentially convey various information about uh, how to construct the, the the drug and how to uh, how to manufacture it at scale. Um, and you know, a lot of the 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 technology that we're developing is trying to say, okay, if you put in this sequence, it will do this. If you put in this sequence, it'll do that. Um, and in the process of building the, like the the precursors for that. Right, I'm not going to credit deep learning here. Just pre- pre- uh, credit the, the the infrastructure development underneath that. We discover like, oh, hey, in some of our assays, whole sections of the DNA have been just cut out and have been looped together into a smaller shape. And uh, and what, what's going on with that? Like, <laughs> this, is, this was nobody's nobody's plan. Your AI is not going to say, wow, that was a really interesting, you know, the phenomenon. <laughs> you should go. That these are the sorts of things where it is that collaboration environment where an AI scientist can. Um, even just in this, in the process of getting things ready for ingestion to an AI, um, can can really make sure that all the all the the data is together and understood, and a lot of these things are overcome. Um, and then, on, of course, on top of it, you, now you get the insights of of okay, now for the ones that are together, what is it? You know, what do we see here? What is interesting? 
And I think it all goes back to like the hardest part that we deal with is, is the biology. We can predict these billion member plasmid libraries to, to build, but then, you know, it could, you know, take us a week to build it, or it could take us, you know, two months, depending on the complexity of it. And we just don't know because it's, it's biology and it, and it keeps it, it keeps it interesting. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for your time, guys. This is really fun. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Lucas. Thank you. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out. 